This is San Francisco. On the same day, in a different part of the city, this is also San Francisco. It's known by many as the city of microclimates, but it's even more famous for its surprisingly cold and foggy summers. And that's a reputation well earned. On an average day in June or July, the high temperature will barely exceed 19 degrees Celsius or about 66 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that at the same time of year, you'd be warmer walking through Dawson City in the Yukon Territory. And just farther inland from San Francisco at the same time, Stockton will be scorching. Stockton sees daytime highs of about 32 to 35 degrees Celsius, or 90 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit in June and July. How could we possibly see so much variability across such a short distance in California? For that matter, how could we see so much variability within the city of San Francisco itself? Well, to understand this phenomenon, we should first zoom out. At subtropical latitudes, large, high-pressure systems tend to form just off the western shores of a continent, the eastern side of an ocean. On their eastern side, they produce very strong and consistent winds that flow toward the equator. When those winds move along the adjacent west coast, they create powerful upwelling, or cold, deep water coming to the surface. Along the Pacific coasts of North and South America, these winds and their associated upwelling are particularly strong. That's due to the presence of north to south running mountain ranges along the shoreline, which channel and strengthen the wind. Stronger wind means more coastal upwelling. In summer, these high pressure systems move toward the poles, bringing their wind and upwelling with them. For San Francisco, that means the North Pacific High moves north in summer, bringing very strong northerly winds and upwelling. And there are three downstream consequences of this upwelling for San Francisco. The first is a shallow layer of dense, relatively cold air offshore. That's because air that comes in contact with the cold water is cooled at the surface. The second is fog. Because warmer, humid air from offshore is being cooled at the surface, water vapor in the air condenses. The result is a thick advection fog, affectionately named coral by the locals. And the third is a drastic temperature gradient. Air in the Central Valley gets a lot hotter in summer compared to the cooler air over the Pacific, and that's a recipe for strong winds. As the hot air in the valley rises due to its low density, denser and cooler air from the Pacific will try to force its way in to replace it. One of the easiest places for that Pacific air to enter the Central Valley is through the Bay Area, the only gap in the coast ranges. So on an average summer day, a shallow layer of dense, cold Pacific air will sweep across the city, bringing advection fog along with it. Nearby Mount Diablo towers above the Bay Area, at about 3,800 feet or over 1,000 meters. But from May through September, it gets far warmer on this peak than it does in downtown San Francisco. That's because Mount Diablo rises above that cooler marine layer. Air above the marine layer is significantly warmer. In meteorology, this is referred to as a temperature inversion. And because all this weird weather is caused by a very shallow air layer, that means it will be strongly influenced by every small mountain or large hill in the Bay Area, resulting in countless unique microclimates all within walking distance from each other. For instance, the eastern side of the peninsula has far more sunshine. Washingtonia palms are healthier on this side of the city, and lemon trees are more productive. This greater sunshine is the result of hills in the center of the city, which slow down the cool marine layer and make the fog more likely to dissipate. As an earth science side note, that doesn't mean this is the perfect side of the city to live. Although the eastern side may be sunnier, it's also the more dangerous place to be during an earthquake, at least close to the bay. That's because much of it is built on soft sediment, even mud taken out of the bay to expand the city. Seismic waves slow down and increase in amplitude 
as they pass through soft sediment, increasing the risk of building collapse. And because this soft sediment is close to the water table, it's prone to liquefaction, or behaving like a liquid during an earthquake. Regardless, there is one time of year when this warmth and sunshine becomes the norm for most of the city. Like most of coastal California, September tends to be the warmest time of year in San Francisco, and October is warmer than June. For the most part, that's because the coastal upwelling offshore weakens in early autumn, and so the chilly marine layer weakens as well. Another major factor behind the hot autumn weather in coastal California is wind from the interior. As air in the desert starts to cool off in autumn, it becomes denser than the warmer air over the Pacific. Denser air from the interior will flow toward the Pacific, and as it crosses mountain ranges, it will be warmed by the Foehn effect. It will also become extremely dry, removing all coastal cloud cover. These winds are called Diablo winds in Northern California, and they're called Santa Ana winds in Southern California. Both winds bring hot and dry conditions with a high risk of wildfire. In short, early autumn is summer for much of coastal California. Finally, there is another fog season in part of California, which can sometimes affect San Francisco. In winter, Thule fog forms in the Central Valley. This is a different type of fog called radiation fog, which tends to form in semi-enclosed basins like the Ebro Valley of Spain, or, as I've mentioned previously, in the Sichuan Basin of China. This foggy air layer is colder than the air over the Pacific, so it will occasionally be drawn through the Bay Area. Again, San Francisco's unique position at a physical gate through the coast ranges leads to unique climatic phenomena. As a gate for commerce and the movement of people, the city has gained cultural diversity. As a gate for the lower atmosphere, the city has gained environmental diversity, with unique microclimates adding to the distinct character of every city block. As always, the sources for this video are in the description. Thanks for watching. If you find these topics interesting, consider subscribing. There will be many more to come.